in terms of um, a relationship between environmental justice movements in the Delta and the quest for self-determination, you know, somewhat there is an intricate relationship between the two, but there is a disjointed link in the process of actualization. Now, let's look at it. Um, the environmental justice movement was created by King Saruman through the movement for the survival of the Goli people, who had a campaign of non-violent campaign to seek using all legal weapons and above all the artistry ingenuity of Ken Sarewua as a writer and as a playwright to reach you know the psyche and minds of the people because that was why and how Ken was able within a short period of time mobilize and energize all the Ogonis to believe in Mosul. Something that you know was not there before then. Now this started and don't forget that in the past the struggles of people like Isaac and Abou, you know, which was treated with violence somehow due to his killing. And when Ken, if you remember the last words of Ken, Ken did predict what is happening in the Niger Delta today. He did predict it. Okay? Now, and for us as students of history in the oil and gas um, development in this country, even the colonial masters, when oil was first struck, and because the practices that were laid down then, which is still what is being practiced today, created room for what is happening today. Because a memo from the colonial office in London to you know, their, their, their office in Nigeria here raised the question that if Nigerians don't ask the question today, they will surely ask this question tomorrow. And that was referring to the issue of fossil fuel extraction, the burning of gas, which is called gas flaring. Now, coming from the prism of a Kesarua and Mosul that had a non-violent, peaceful struggle, and the brutal murder of Kesarua and his colleagues, the nine Ogonis, added to the previous four Ogonis, Ogoni leaders, that were killed as a result of fallout of interaction with these multinationals. Now, you see that the disconnect began to occur. People began to think, is it really, you know, necessary to continue the non-violent struggle? Okay? And if you speak, you'll be killed. If you campaign, you'll be killed. This agitation continued to be in the mind of the people because, of course, all issues for us as environmentalists, we trace all the crises in this country to the environment. Because people are disenchanted, the type of environment you have determines the type of development you have both psychologically, mentally, physiologically, and otherwise, okay? Now, with a violent people born in a violent environment, violent in the sense that the activities of the corporations with the whole support of the Nigerian states who have militarized the communities, using military operations, using soldiers at the slightest disagreement to dislodge citizens who are making genuine agitations for their livelihood. What will that bring about? That helped, you know, to 
create this sense of militancy in the younger Nigerians. Of course, um, like we said, the people that were born at a certain point in Nigeria had all their time, most of their time, under the military jackboot. So everything you see is command and order. So that is what it built into the psyche of the people. Along the line, along the line, you know, the campaign for environmental justice was going on. Don't destroy the environment so that we can have our livelihood and nobody was listening until, you know, the emergence of Asari Dokobo. Okay? Now, Asari Dokobo did not start violently. No. We must give that credit to him. He didn't start violently. Even when men started, men did not start as a violent group. They started as, you know, um, activists demanding for their rights and the rights of their people. Trying to make a statement. But the mismanagement of the whole affair, instead of listening to the people, you now attack them, create divide and rule, and then begin to set people against each other. This is where, you know, these issues of militancy, you know, came in. I will never forget the statement that Asari Nokobo made when the government of uh, former President Pulisha Mabasanjo threatened to arrest him. He said, and that was after um, his um, attending of a Pronaco meeting with genuine activists in this country to fashion a way out of the woods for this country. He was threatened with an arrest. And he said, don't bother arresting me because the struggle in the Niger Delta, because I am there, has a face, has a figure. If you arrest me today, you will have more than hundreds of Asari Dokobos that you cannot know how to arrest them, and you cannot see who to speak to. And that was exactly what happened when Asari Dokobo was arrested. The issue, the dimension of the agitation changed. To men now began to make kidnaps. And if we followed the history, of the early days of men, they were kidnapping, they were not demanding for ransom. They were kidnapping to make statements. And after making that statement, they would release their victims. But when that continued, and for us as students of re revolutionary studies, you know that in every revolutionary struggle, the revolutionaries will be doing the right thing to save the state, good ones will equally capitalize on that to come in. This is where, you know, the incident of violence came in. Now, people now saw it as an opportunity. Well, if people can be kidnapped, you know, splinter groups, people that had scores to settle, commanders now began to emerge from here and there, and the question is this. Today, we know better because those persons are they not talking with governments? Why didn't government talk with them at that point in time to nip the issues on board? It's only after many destructions. Because for us as environmentalists, we tell the agitators yes, your agitation is with everybody in Nigeria has the right to agitate for fair treatment. Everybody. But the methodology makes a difference. Now, if you go about blowing up pipes, who are you hurting? You are hurting your environment. You are giving us more job to do. And at the end of the day, even if issues are resolved, it will take longer time for those issues to be resolved. For the effects and impacts to begin to be felt better. Now, if you kill your brother, your sister, 
in the name of trying to make a statement, on whose behalf are you making such statements? These are the areas where we disagree, you know, with whatever form of agitation that takes violent nature. Okay, be it Boko Haram, be it men, be it anybody, any group at all. Once you engage in bloodshed, you, as far as we are concerned, we are, we are no longer agitated. Because the person that you, you, you killed today, you wouldn't know whether that person would be the savior that all of us would have had in the future. Okay. Now, this was how in the days of Kensaro were, and coming up a little bit, you know, they had documented materials, you know, in terms of charters and bills of rights, bills of demands, the Kayama Declaration, the Ogoni Bill of Rights, the Oron Bill of Rights, and the Urobo and the Shekiri, you know, these were documents that they prepared, discussed, you know, and agreed these are our minimal requirements and conditions for dialogue and discussion. Okay, now, those documents and those demands are still lively demands so many years after they were made. But you see where the dislink comes in is that today I don't see, I've not had men or any of these other groups demanding to say, let's go back, sit down and look at the Kayama Declaration and begin to discuss from that perspective. Or let's go back to the Ogoni Bill of Rights. So it became at a point, at a point, and this is what I've said personally, at a point it became a criminal activity. Of course, I know that it is justified in revolutionary struggles that criminals will equally come up and if care is not taken, they might divert the attention the, of the genuine agitators and cover everything with the criminal conduct, which was exactly what happened in the case of the Niger Delta struggles. Then at a point, everybody now talked about the criminality. Nobody talked about the original idea that brought about this crisis in the Delta which is the relationship of the people with the environment and how the corporations and governments had respected or disrespected the citizens' rights to a healthy, conducive environment. Okay, so you, you can now see that there is both a historical link and a practical dislink, you know, between the self-determination activists and the environmental justice campaigners in the Delta. At the end of the day, what one will sum up to say will be that, well, they are roots to the solution of every problem. Environmental justice campaigners are saying our own root is, you know, treat citizens, treat human beings as human beings.